This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's Crimes and Consequences. This story is a very recent story, and the person that committed the crime was only sentenced in April of wow. this year. So I want to ask everybody to take one second to hit the subscribe slash follow button on whatever beautiful app you're listening to us on, because that really helps us. Yes, please do that. And with that, I'm just going to get going. Let's do it. This story is about Breland. She went by Breezy Addison. She was 17 years old when the story takes place in 2018. She's described as an outspoken young girl with swiping long brown hair. She loved listening to music, going to parties, baseball, gymnastics, swimming, being outdoors, and most of all, spending time with her family. She had struggled through recent years after her mom, Nanette, died in a tragic car accident. Oh, that has to be awful. Yeah, I mean, she was a young teen, and she lost her mom. That's heartbreaking. In September of 2017, she met and fell in love with an 18-year-old boy named Riley Powell. And eventually, it didn't take long before she moved into his family's home in Eureka, Utah. Do you know anything about Eureka, Utah? Sure don't. I bet you don't. (laughs) It's tiny. Eureka used to be a silver mining town. I kind of figured with a name like Eureka. Eureka. Yeah, Eureka. I didn't didn't even think of that. And it's located about 75 miles south of Salt Lake City. At the time of the story, its population was a whopping 669 people. Holy shit, it is small. Yeah, it was once the financial center for the Tintic Mining District a wealthy gold and silver mining area in both Utah and Job counties. And you'll learn a little bit more about the mines later in the story. But Eureka, it's kind of, no offense to the people that live there, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I think my high school was bigger. Oh, yeah. Right? right? (laughs) That's, yeah, the whole town. Now, Riley, he's 18. He was described as a bit stocky with some golden brown hair and he wore glasses. Just like Breezy, he struggled with his own issues. At one time, a few years earlier, he brought a gun to high school. He was going to go hunt rabbits afterwards. But when school officials found out about the gun, he ended up getting expelled. And he got sent to live in a boy's home. Eventually, he changed schools. And he graduated in 2017 from North San Pete High School. After graduating, he got a job as a plumber, and he was considered a hard worker. Riley liked to play basketball. He enjoyed dragster racing and off-road riding in his dad's Jeep. I mean, I'm guessing there's probably not a lot to do out in Eureka. Breezy and Riley were madly in love. It was something they were both desperately searching for, a connection with somebody else. Around Thanksgiving... Breezy excitedly told her family that she thought she was pregnant, but she later found out she wasn't. And she was disappointed. I think she really just wanted to be in love and have her own family. Christmas rolled around, and it was a really enjoyable time for the couple. After celebrating the holidays on the evening of December 29th, Riley and Breezy drove in Riley's Jeep to a family member's house just to have some more belated Christmas celebration. Sure. That's what I read. By that time, they'd been together for four months. Later, they stopped in a city called Spanish Fork, Utah, and I'm sure it's right around Eureka. And then after they went to Spanish Fork and did whatever they did, they went and visited a woman named Morgan Lewis Henderson, who was 34 years old. It's believed, and I can't confirm it, that Riley briefly dated Morgan, even though he's 18. Really? I can only confirm for sure that they were friends. 
It was around 9.30 when Riley sent his family a text saying they were getting ready to head back to their Eureka home, but they ended up driving around some more. And like I said, they ended up at Morgan Lewis Henderson's home. They never made it back to Eureka. They simply disappeared. Their family was concerned about them, but given the fact that they were two young, spontaneous teens and New Year's happened, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, they didn't grow really concerned until about a little after January 1st. And by January 2nd, their concern had escalated to the point that they reported them missing to the police. So the last time they were seen was December 29th? Yes. The police took Riley and Breezy's disappearance really seriously. Being that they were teens, the police started a social media investigation. That's probably a great idea. Right? Since teens and now us adults, we're always on social media. It's a, the bane of my existence. <laughs> I'm always on social media. I could stop. See, I'm not on it that much. Oh my God. Just, mostly I just, for our podcast. Girl, I got into TikTok too. Like within the last month, I'm oh always watching TikTok. Oh my God, I haven't TikTok. gotten into TikTok yet. I gotta yet. stop. I gotta stop. It's such a time suck. I gotta stop. Yeah, man. But there's so much to see. <laughs> uh, yeah, now I've got to figure that one out. I'm going to have to look. Only thing I've ever seen are like funny cat videos. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. They focused in particular on Riley's Facebook interactions for December 29th. It showed that he had messaged Morgan Henderson at around 11 p.m. asking if they could stop by. That messenger contact with Morgan was the last time Riley used any of his social media accounts. And Breezy ceased using all of her social media accounts after that, too. So who is Morgan Henderson? She's 34 years old. She's a single mom to a young son. And she suffered from schizoaffect disorder, bipolar, and depression, and constantly used mushrooms to hallucinate. So given that she was the last one that they know that Riley contacted, they stopped by on January 9th, the police, and they visited Morgan's home. She lived in a small town called Mammoth in Job County. When I say a small town. <laughs> it's even smaller than Eureka? Mammoth is like a ghost town. Its peak population was in 1920 and had 750 people. Oh my God. These tiny towns. It was, it was roughly three miles from Eureka. The area is popular with ghost town enthusiasts, campers, off-road vehicle riders, and hikers. There's nothing in mammoth. I mean, honestly, what do you do? Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Fucking A. No wonder she did mushrooms. There's not shit to nope. do. Morgan lived with a 41-year-old man, her boyfriend, named Jared Baum, and also Jared Baum's father in Jared Baum's father's house. When the police arrived to their house, they separated Morgan from Jared and they took Morgan into the police car. They're talking to Morgan and she says the teens never made it to her house. And when they talked to Jared inside the house, he allowed them to look around. They didn't see anything. And Jared said he didn't see the teens at their house either. So he, as far as he knew, they never made it there. Morgan did tell the police officers that she'd heard a rumor that Riley got into a fight on New Year's Eve with an unknown man after, quote, stealing drugs from some Mexicans, end quote. With that, the police left. There was no evidence of any involvement in foul play. And at this point, they don't even know what's going on with Breezy and Riley. They could have ran away for all they know. Right. In the meantime, both Riley and Breezy's families just searched all around the desert area looking for any signs of the teens or their car or anything. They called all their friends. They did everything they were supposed to do, but there were no leads. On January 11th, an aerial search ended up locating Riley's missing Jeep. It appeared to be intentionally abandoned by someone near Cherry Creek Road near the Cherry Creek Reservoir. And that's about 14 miles away from Eureka. Its view had been obscured by trees, so you couldn't see the Jeep from the road. It was only through the aerial search that they were able to find it. When they searched the Jeep, they didn't find any blood or any signs of a struggle. There was nothing odd about it. 
at least not on the inside. However, someone had slashed two of the Jeeps for tires. Investigators noted that there was this, it's a a camouflage tie-down strap, and it was stuck in the driver's side of the door. Now, these kind of straps are often used for towing a vehicle. Oh, okay. They got a hook on the end. So they found that. On January 15th, the police obtained a search warrant for the home where Riley's mother, her name was Misty Carlson, and Riley's grandmother, her name was Linda Powell, lived. And it was in like Tool County or something like that. I don't know where they lived. Riley's mother and grandmother fully cooperated with police. However, Riley's mother's boyfriend, his name was William Larson, but it went by Clubby. He refused to talk with them, which really heightened their suspicions. They ended up getting a search warrant and they searched the house, the vehicles on the property, and the property itself. And authorities made a public statement saying that, quote, the investigation has significantly advanced after searching the property, end quote. But no arrests were made. Now, on the property, in one of the residents' trucks, I don't know if the mom, grandma, or clubbies, they located an identical camouflage tie-down strap matching the one found in Riley's Jeep. Authorities suspected that the tie-down strap had been used to tow and conceal the Jeep to, quote, give the illusion the victims were stranded. The tires were slashed, so I don't know. Right. They also found drug paraphernalia at the house. Cops ended up sending in cadaver dogs to search the area, but they didn't find anything. Regardless of what the police were trying to put out to the public, Riley and Breezy's family continued to deny any knowledge or involvement in the disappearance of Riley and Breezy. They conducted their own searches. They scoured Utah's West Desert looking just for any clues as to what happened. But all their searches turned up nothing. Police decided to re-question Morgan Henderson a week later, this time alone. Once again, she denied that the teens had ever been to her house on the evening of December 29th or the early morning hours of the 30th. But when police pushed her, telling them, listen, we have this message from Facebook that says that they were coming over at around 11 p.m., she ends up saying, okay, they did stop by, they wanted some cigarettes, we smoked some weed, but they left after a brief visit, and they didn't tell me where they were planning on going. She claimed she hadn't heard from them since. So now her story has changed a little bit, right? Police continued their investigation, interviewing all of Riley and Breezy's family and friends, but they were really becoming suspicious of Morgan. Why would you lie to the police? Right. Unless you're doing something fucking shady. Mm -hmm. Months went by with no word from Breezy and Riley. No activities on the phones. They couldn't locate their phones. No social media. It was like they just vanished. But then the police got a break in their case. On March 25th, Morgan was pulled over for driving crazy. She was speeding. She was all over the place. And she got arrested There was some ongoing investigation for drugs and weapon charges. I don't even know about that. But I know when they pulled her over, she had a forty-five caliber handgun. What? She had several knives, an axe, a rifle. They were all found in her trunk. And officers later learned that she'd taken psychedelic mushrooms, which is why she was driving like a crazy bat out of hell. And that she planned on jumping off a cliff to kill herself. What? She was carrying around a secret, some guilt that she just couldn't live with anymore. Oh, man. So they arrested her on all these charges. She also had an open container. So she was drinking. Oh, fuck. On mushrooms. She's high on mushrooms and then drinking too. And I'm going to guess she's stoned. I'm just throwing that in there. (laughs) I'm just throwing it in there. I guess when there's like 600 people in your town, I guess driving crazy on a road isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, I'm surprised. Probably not a lot of traffic. Right. (laughs) Okay. It's probably still not safe, but okay. After her arrest, she broke down and told the police she just couldn't live with a secret anymore. And she wanted to share with them the truth of what happened to Riley and Breezy. But she was afraid for her own life. 
she was sure her boyfriend Jared was going to kill her. And her fear was reasonable based on his given history. So let me tell you a little bit about Jared William Baum. He's 41. He is a scary and dangerous man. He's a big guy. He stood six foot four and weighed 300 pounds. Oh, shit. He was a pagan who worshipped Norse gods and would perform rituals on Morgan, which included drawing symbols on her body with her own blood. That's fucking weird. <laughs> yes. At the age of 15, so this is in 1991, he was charged with attempted murder. Oh, man. He was 15? Yeah. He stole several vehicles, and then he robbed a Burger King restaurant at gunpoint. He fired shots at some of the workers as he fled the scene, so that was the attempted murder. He ended up doing time, and while he was in the correctional facility or institute, it was a central Utah correctional facility, he was charged with assault in connection to a five-hour riot. Oh, my God. He eventually got out, and then in 2005, he was sentenced to 11 years in federal prison on firearms and weapon charges. He's just a bad, bad dude. He was released in July of 2016, and then he was put on parole. And I, for some reason, Morgan found him. Irresistible? Tr- yeah, but there's probably very slim pickings in Mammoth. <laughs> you <I'm> think? Guessing. <laughs> On multiple occasions, he threatened Morgan and her young son if she ever revealed what he did on that fateful, cold December night, he'd kill them. But inevitably, over a course of two days, Morgan told the police everything. She admitted that she lied the first time, the first two times they questioned her. And according to Morgan, Jared had confessed to her that he was responsible for 18 unsolved murders and what? he was willing, yeah. What? And he's willing to add her to the list. Oh, my fucking God. He told her that he first shot somebody when he was only eight years old and committed his first murder at the age of 13. Oh, stop. Really? That's what he told her. <sighs> I hope that's not true. And she was scared to death that she would be the next victim. Fucking eight, yeah. See, now you know why she didn't want to say anything. Yeah, no shit. Before I tell you what happened to Riley and Breezy on December 29th, we're going to take a quick break. Riley and Breezy visited Morgan. It was a little after 11 at Jared Baum's dad's house. They, like I said, smoked some weed. They had some cigarettes. And then they got in their car to go back to Eureka. According to Morgan, when they left her house... As they were getting in their car, Jared came home. A few minutes later, he came inside. He grabbed a fleece jacket of hers, Morgan's, and some gloves and told her to come outside. When she did, she saw Riley and Breezy in the back of his Jeep. The wrists and ankles were bound and duct tape was placed over their mouths. I'm sure she was like, what the fuck? What the fuck? He made Morgan get into the front seat. He told her. I warned you that no men were allowed at this house, and now you're going to learn a lesson. The four drove a few miles away to an open mine pit in the remote area of Eureka, known as the West Desert. Once Jared parked the Jeep, he ripped the duct tape from the teen's mouth, and he helped them smoke a cigarette. Apparently, he was acting very charming, too, making conversation with them. They had to be completely freaked. Oh, I would have been terrified. Terrified. Like, what the hell is going on? And he, like, he was described as being charming. Like, dude, you've tied me up with duct tape and you're being charming? This is just weird. Helping me smoke a cigarette? Yeah. Breezy told him that she was pregnant and begged him for mercy. It was later determined she wasn't pregnant, but he didn't show any mercy of any form to the teens. He cut the binds from their ankles, and then he forced them to walk towards an open mine pit. It was a quarter-mile walk in the cold, dark night, and he kept congratulating them on their future baby. They staggered in the dark through sagebrush in this light snow towards this gaping hole in the ground. Breezy complained that she was allergic to sagebrush, And she asked Jared if he could untie her hands because the binds were so tight they were cutting off her circulation. Her hands were going numb. But he told her no. They're almost at their destination. Oh, no. Once at the pit, 
he forced Breezy and Morgan to their knees and he made them kneel. Riley was forced to stand in front of the women as if they were an audience to what was about to happen. Riley asked if he could give Breezy one last kiss, but Jared refused to let him. And by then, the two teens had to know what their fate is. This is an open mine shaft. There's pictures you can see on our website. It's a massive gaping hole in the ground. Breezy and Morgan were made to watch on their knees as Riley was beaten by Jared, who was shouting profanities. I don't know what he was saying, but he was calling Riley names. He was beating him. Breezy was crying hysterically, and at one point, Morgan remembers grabbing Breezy's hand, tied hand. Then the beating turned into savage stabbing in multiple areas, including the groin and the neck. Morgan heard Riley say, I'm dying. She said, quote, it sounded like he was drowning. He gurgled. I remember thinking, like, I think he'd been stabbed in the lung or his throat had been cut because he was gurgling. It sounded like he was drowning. It was the most terrible noise, end quote. Jared kept stabbing Riley until the gurgling stopped. Then he waved and said, goodbye, Riley, you piece of shit, and pushed the teen in the mine pit. Oh, my God. What the hell? What is going on? Oh, my God. (sighs) They must have been terrified watching this. And poor Riley. I know. And for he didn't what? do anything. And I know they didn't do anything. He came to visit a friend. Because Jared was jealous. Yeah. What a psycho. Once he killed Riley, Jared turned his rage towards Breezy. She pleaded and begged for her life. She told him she wouldn't tell a single soul about what happened if he just let her go. He stepped near her and he told her, quote, It's okay, darling. Then, with a knife still dripping with Riley's blood, He went behind her and he slashed her throat. (gasps) Oh my God. He then cradled her, rocking her in his arms as she died. And then he threw her into the pit like she was disposable trash. According to Morgan, quote, he looked manic. He looked overjoyed. He's got this huge grin on his face like he's enjoying himself, end quote. She later said, I was still on my knees. I was crying. I was thinking like, this is it. Here we go. It's my turn, end quote. But instead of killing her, he told her she needed to help him clean up the crime. And there was so much blood on the ground that he began pushing snow and dirt around to try to cover it up. You can imagine on the drive back, Morgan was terrified. Oh, my God. How do you go home after this? I don't know. I would do a lot of mushrooms. Right. <laughs> A lot of oh weed. Oh my God, seriously, how know. do you go I don't home? Know. He told Morgan that he enjoyed making Riley suffer so much, but he felt bad about killing Breezy. So that's why he made her death, quote, quick and painless. He later laughed about it and said it was like lambs to the slaughter. They didn't even fight. That's a quote. As Morgan started crying, he told her to remember that she had a small boy to consider. If she wanted him to grow up, she really needed to think about what she was going to do. Basically, keep her yes. mouth shut. He later told her he felt bad about killing Breezy because he'd never killed an innocent person before. So apparently Riley was... Yeah, was guilty of was something. guilty, but... But Breezy wasn't. Two days later, so on March 27th, Morgan led the police to the Tintic Standard Mine Shaft number 2 in the remote area of Eureka. It's a large desert area, literally as I have described, in the middle of nowhere. The investigators used a camera to look down the shaft, which was 1,800 feet deep. Damn. Yeah. The camera ended up locating two bodies about 100 feet down that landed on a ledge. With the camera, they could see that the bodies had their hands bound behind their backs, and they clearly had found Breezy and Riley. It took law enforcement an entire day to secure the bodies and lift them out of the Tintic Standard Mine Shaft number two. Then Morgan led police to other evidence that Jared had hid or otherwise tried to dispose of, including one of the camouflage tie-downs that was once in Riley's Jeep. So they were Riley's camouflage tie-downs, which, I mean, makes sense that his family would have the same ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That wasn't very strong evidence. No. The knife to kill them was stashed in an oil barrel along with Riley's keys. 
She also led them to a spot where they could find the clothes that both she and Jared had been wearing that night of the murders. Now, after the murders, Jared made her undress. Then he cut their clothes into pieces and their shoes and the gloves. And then he soaked them in bleach. And he made her take a shower using bleach to clean herself. Oh. And he did the same thing. What the hell? I don't know. That sounds bad. Yeah. Ugh. That's pretty drastic. Ble- bleach on your skin. Not I good. know. Bleach can't. Mm-mm. They burned their clothes, and Morgan admitted to helping hide Riley's Jeep, stating that Jared had threatened to cut her head off if she didn't help him. I would have totally believed him. Yeah. I mean, he'd been violent with her in the past, in case you thought he hadn't. At one point during one of his rages, he placed a garrote around her throat, and he just began tightening it. Obviously, he ended up releasing it. Jared was arrested that day on suspicion of murder, and Morgan was arrested for obstruction of justice based on the lies she told the officers in the earlier interview. So I got to tell you something I thought was kind of interesting. They issued a warrant to photograph Jared's tattoos because he had a lot of them. He was a white supremacist, in case you... Oh, Lord. In case that comes as a surprise, right? Surprise! They wanted to see if Jared had added any new tattoos since the murder of Riley and Breezy. Prior to the murder, he had over two dozen, 24 tattoos. And people that knew Jared said he regarded his tattoos as records oh, no. of sorts. His tattoos included multiple swastika tattoos, one being the center of his upper chest. He had tattoos of demons, an iron cross, Norse imagery, and headstones with initials on them. Well, that's fucking weird. Yeah. Yeah, what the hell? But it didn't appear that any recent tattoos, so maybe he just, I don't know, didn't get around to it he yet? He didn't get around to it I yet, I don't know. Maybe. It took four years for the trial to begin. It started on March 7th of 2022. The prosecutor, his name was David Levitt, he decided not to seek the death penalty for whatever reason. And this really upset Breezy and Riley's family. They really wanted him to have, like, an execution date hanging over his head. But, I don't know, for whatever reason, the prosecutor decided to not pursue the death penalty. At the trial, Jared's defense team attempted to seek into evidence that Morgan was the killer. Oh, come on. And this is really something I'd I'd never heard of before. Being a lawyer, I'd never heard of this. They did it through what's known as the legal doctrine of chances. What? The doctrine of chances. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Allows evidence to show that it's unlikely a person would repeatedly, innocently be involved in similar suspicious circumstances. So let me explain what he's trying to say. He's trying to show that Morgan was the one that killed Riley and Breezy based on other deaths of people in her life. His defense argued that Morgan had killed her mother. Morgan's mother, her name was Shelley. She got into a serious car accident in 2017, and she ended up dying of an overdose of fentanyl. Now, Morgan's ex-husband's current wife, who was also Morgan's friend, was willing to testify that Morgan had told her that she killed her mother with an overdose of fentanyl patches as a form of mercy killing. Okay, so that's one death here on Morgan. In 2016, Morgan was married to a man named Tregan Lewis. He died in 2016 by putting a gun to his head and killing himself in front of Morgan. Morgan was the only witness to his death, which was later ruled a suicide. Then again, in 2017, a man Morgan was dating named Clint Lewis sat in the passenger seat of a car that ended up crashing into a tree. Now... The driver pled guilty to manslaughter, and I don't even know if Morgan was in the car at the time or not. Just that she knew him? I I guess. (laughs) That's a lot of deaths. That is a lot of deaths, a lot of weird deaths. Right. Jared's attorney argued that the likelihood of this happening by pure chance in a year and a half to Morgan was 45 billion to one. Oh my God. So therefore, she must have. She must have been the killer. She must have been the killer. Except the medical examiner testified that the blunt force that was done to Riley, it it couldn't have been caused by Morgan. It was just too, like, whoever did it was way stronger than she was. That is a lot of fucked up shit to happen to one person. That is. But that is a very creative defense, by the way. That would possibly give someone some 
doubt, right? Some maybe. reasonable doubt, maybe like, hmm. I mean, really, Morgan would go and do this I mean, by yeah, herself. What, what is her motive for doing it? Yeah. Just how is she overpowering all of them and right. all that? It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't make any sense, but I can understand why the defense attorney did that. Well, anyway, the judge wouldn't allow the argument to be made in front of the jury because <laughs> it's stupid. Even though Morgan wasn't the most credible, she did speak at trial. And here's a clip of her explaining why she chose to confess to the police about the murders. I wanted those families to know where their teenagers were. I didn't want them to sit in that hole forever. I wanted them to know what happened. I wanted them to know where Riley and Breezy were. The police had come and raided our house and left and didn't find anything. So they moved on. Like he got away with it and I was not okay with that. And um, I felt a lot of guilt and shame. In the next clip, she states what she witnessed that cold December night. He's got this huge grin on his face like he's enjoying himself. And he was, um, he did later, he laughed about it. He said that was like lambs to the slaughter. They didn't even fight. I heard Riley say, I'm dying. And he was gurgling. And that's when I realized that he wasn't hitting Riley. He was stabbing Riley. It's so sad. On April 15th of 2022, the jury reached the verdict. And here is a clip of their decision. Guilty. <laughs> State of Utah versus Jared William Baum. We, the jury in the above entitled case, unanimously find beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Jared William Bond, is count one, guilty of aggravated murder. Count two, guilty of aggravated murder. <coughs> count three, guilty of aggravated kidnapping. Count four, guilty of aggravated kidnapping. Count five, guilty of abuse or desecration of a dead human body. Count six, guilty of abuse or desecration of a dead human body. Count eight, guilty of obstructing justice. Dated this 15th day of April, 2022, under the signature of the foreperson. During sentencing, the 4th District Judge, his name was Derek Pullen, spoke about his feelings regarding the brutal murders. It's a little fuzzy at first, but here's what he had to say. Remember that these simple privileges of waking and sleeping and waking again are privileges Riley and Breelin no longer experience because you murdered them. I have served as a district court judge for almost 20 years. During that time, I have been witness to many acts of violence. But the murders of Riley Powell and Breelin Audison are the most violent the most selfish, the most senseless, the most disturbing that I have ever witnessed. Then Jared spoke. Oh, fuck, really? Yeah, he did. You know, he denied everything. Mm -hmm. And let's play a little clip of that. I'm not a monster. I don't, I don't kill people. I've been in prison a long time. I've been in many fights. I've been in situations where I've been caught with, with shanks, you know. But one, and I've got plenty of writers back then. One thing you can never say, and that you will never see, is that during any of my altercations that I've ever used a weapon. He says, I'm not a monster. Yeah, I didn't okay. do it. I've never killed anybody. Really? Okay. He never killed anybody. Yeah, sure. Mm-mm. Jared is currently housed in the Utah State Correctional Facility, where he will remain for the rest of his life. For her part in all this murder and madness, Morgan Lewis Henderson received three years in prison. And in surprising news, the mines were recently found to contain more gold. Really? So maybe the town will prosper a bit. Maybe. Probably not. It's probably owned by some corporation. Yeah, and, it is. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. 
Anyway, that is the really sad story of Breezy Addison and Riley Powell. That is a terrible story. That was a total pisser. Like, for what? Jealousy. Yeah, jealousy. I know a lot of the stories that we tell are like, like, you know, what are these stupid motives? But, God, they're always so fucking sad. They're only 17 and 18 years old. They're just kids. It's terrifying. It had to have been. I can't even imagine being 17 years old, watching my boyfriend get the shit kicked out of him and then stabbed multiple times and then pushed into a mine shaft. Yeah, I just, I'm getting chills. Just I know. My stomach hurt it. through this whole story. So anyway. That was a pisser, man. Thanks, Talia. For the sources, I'll put them in our, in our notes. I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to us. Yes. Listen to this story. I really thought that Breezy and Riley's story needed to be heard. And if you haven't done so already, please click the subscribe or follow button on your favorite app. And if you like listening to us a lot, (laughs) you can go to patreon.com slash TNT crimes and you can hear, oh, I don't even know. Don't know. So many episodes. Four billion. Four billion episodes that are (laughs) exclusive to patreon.com slash TNT crime members. Plus you get early releases and ad free episodes and you can do the same thing by subscribing to our apple podcast channel if you're listening on apple just click it click 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 (laughs) you can find us on social media at hardcore true crime for instagram and facebook and we have a website crimesandconsequences.com lots of stuff you can do got merchandise the merchandise is fun yeah i've got a shirt on today yes what's it say talia it says i'm dead inside Crimes and Consequences. It's got a little sexy skeleton on it. Yes, it it does. This is my favorite shirt of ours. I made that one. Yes, I know you did. (laughs) It's one of my faves. Thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone for listening and until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.